को पावर्ड बाय ग्रीन लैम लैमिनेट्स हर गुस्ता की साफ Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I am Udayan Mukherjee. My guest today is a global management powerhouse. Uh, he is a management guru in his own right, uh, a very very respected business consultant, in fact an advisor and guide to some of the world's largest corporations and some of the world's best known CEOs. He also happens to be a best-selling author whose books have sold millions of copies over the years. So Uh it gives me great pleasure to welcome on the show the one and only Dr. Ram Charan Ram it's wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you Uday I'm honored to be on the show and I love to learn what's happening and love great. to learn your questions. Okay my first question is about the global situation Ram on which you've been writing very actively but you know because this Ukraine war has actually exposed uh, many of the western countries for example like germany who have been dependent on natural resources like gas from russia but you've been pointing out that even countries like america need to uh, reassess how dependent they want to be on a country like china going forward so do you think the ukraine war brings to the to a head this question that you've been pointing out or this issue that you've been pointing out for many months now that the large global western economies actually need to take a hard look at how they are running their economies today absolutely with that that the world has reset global reset major discontinuity where now the people have woken up from the russia and ukraine war that there are bifurcation where countries want to go china is totally explicit they want self sufficiency and western countries had outsourced their supply chain to one country so they are highly dependent on china and no good business will be dependent on one supplier so this is not going to be reset it is creating shortages and it is creating higher prices energy prices energy problems are getting quite big and so is the food so now every country has to think about how they become self sufficient and with whom they got to trade but no country can afford a dependence on another country for supply chain mm. How long will this process of disentangling entanglement take uh, Ram in your eyes and what could be because these processes are built over many decades are never easy to uh, disentangle uh, do you see a lot of collateral damage happening while this plays out yes the transition in some sectors and products has begun it's slow and people have to come to terms that we have to accelerate for example in the cell phones apple has been very wise they had begun earlier they are now building supply chains also in other countries including india they are also building onshoring and they're getting their suppliers who happen to be taiwanese and having them build factories for assembly in the united states so that has begun it requires determination resilience and so on and this will take some time but it requires that people be determined and do it technologies are available they are the ones that went to china from taiwan hong kong uh europe Uh, Australia and the United States they are there engineering and technology so we need to start governments may have to help rab uh, on the point that you are mentioning uh, i just want to ask you what kind of pushback do you see from countries like china and russia because they also surely can see this transition which is going on do you expect them to take it easily or lying down or do you expect some kind of a hostile pushback from these economies you know, there will be actions and reactions no doubt there'll be hard negotiations hard bargaining 
if you look at United States and China, China needs things from the United States. So there will be bargaining on some technologies and whatnot. And there will be areas where there will be a tariff or there will be import controls. All this is going to happen because it is not going to be one way street. Mm. Now, this axis which is forming, which is, say, countries like China and Russia on one side, uh, where do you see India fitting into this picture? Because India so far kept its options open. Do you think it, will, it can get off by towing a kind of a middle path in this whole uh, wrangling game which is going on? Yeah, India is very crucial in minimum two ways. One, that the people in the West, America, Europe, have now realized that they cannot have total sufficiency of supply chain. They want to come to India. Our Honorable Minister of Commerce, Piyush Goyal, said that how he's meeting people in, in Geneva, in, uh, in Davos, they all want to come now because India has transparency. It has a great proven legal system. Here, the business people do want cost of capital. And the government of India is very much getting opened up to invite FDI. So India will receive a lot of FDI, a lot of supply chain ideas and plants going to be here. And so India has a good growth opportunity and India has to deal with the, the trade deficit it is incurring with China. In the last 22 years, it has incurred about $700 billion worth of deficit. Last year, they had $70 billion of deficit in trade. All those things have to be taken into account and build the supply chain gradually in India. Mm. But do you think we are up for the challenge, Ram? I mean, that's my critical question to you, because, you know, India has done very well on the services front. But you've been you've sat on the boards of companies like Hindalco. Do you think Indian manufacturing can actually become a global powerhouse? Because so far we've not been a manufacturing powerhouse in the way some of the other Asian economies yeah. have. Yeah. So first, Hindalco is global. Hindalco has business in yeah. packaging in the United States, totally global, in every which way you look at. There are other businesses in the Birla Group that are totally global. Now, but the basic intent of the question is our ability to have cost structure, high quality, export, and competitive. We can't do that because the prices we pay for imports are nominal, but they are based on subsidies and the currency parity that is largely artificial. That needs to change. So for example, in the case of China, 1999, it was 450 RMBB to the dollar. It's now 680. And according to the old way of rules, if you have such a large surplus, like 3.4 trillion China has, you should be revaluing your currency. They have not. And if you revalue the currency, those things will be not competitive. These are the issues going to be ironed out as we go forward. We cannot say that we are mm. a prisoner of a country. We got to unlock it. Mm. Do you see any systemic issues other than the currency exchange or the foreign exchange issue that you spoke about? Any other systemic issues, ha having dealt with Indian companies in the past, uh, no, which the, might be holding currency, back or which could come in the way of India actually exploiting the opportunity? Yeah, no. Currency issue, subsidies issue, they're all there. But we need to go on our own because we can compete. We have new technology, new automation. We have the artificial intelligence. Our, our people in AI and so on are the largest and the best in the world. 
they are working outside India and inside India. We just have to work. And the work means the industry people must figure out the facts, define what they need, and join the government initiative. It's going to require both sides working together, pick each industry sector, which sectors first, which sectors second. For example, in pharmaceuticals, API is a big important sector. We can do that. We have a reasonably good pharmaceutical industry. We import APIs. So let's pick together, see what we need, do the facts, go on the industry basis to the ministers, show them, and they will collaborate. Mm. What about the issue of talent or skilled manpower, Ram? Because that seems to be another interesting challenge. On one hand, we have very high levels of unemployment. On the other hand, companies keep complaining that they don't have enough employable uh, talent in the country. How do you see that from an Indian perspective? Yeah, this is a very good point over there. We got to go category by category. And we know many people want to come home from overseas. And we are even getting things today. You don't have to code. Machines will do the coding. We have that today. So we pick sector by sector. And in that sector, see what we need. Where is it worldwide? Go at it. We may not be able to do for all the sectors at the same time. So we're going to sequence that. Mm. But what do you think is going on with a sector like information technology? I mean, you know, there is a huge attrition problem out there in that sector. And that's where this whole talent deficit seems to be showing up most acutely. No question. We are doing things. We are getting training. We have people being putting online. I met one yesterday that I was going to train these people in less than 10 weeks in a certain areas online, test them, and they are available. We may have to import from for the critical, very critical jobs like the general intelligence. But idea here is we should avoid generalities. We should go sector by sector. We sequence them. We have the talent. Certain areas we may have to go outside and subcontract that. Mm. And, you know, we were speaking about manufacturing as a sector uh, earlier. But in your interactions yeah. with large Indian corporations, do yeah. you get the feeling that Indian companies are ready to adopt digital in a big way? Because, you know, Many of the old world companies may not actually have made that digital transformation. How digital ready do you find in the old Indian corporations that you speak to? I, I had one in the last five days. They got the message. They're, they're, they're really the new generation in those families are appalled why the father didn't move. Because they now know they can't live without it. They will become uncompetitive. Family will lose wealth. So that's beginning to come. The second dilemma was that we have to do it internally. Well, no, you got to outsource. There are a ton of outsourcing companies in India that are doing the work for the outsiders. So we, we plan this bite by bite and sequence it, build it. More people will get trained for it and go for it. We cannot do the whole elephant in one bite. Mm. So you're saying it's an intergenerational issue where the older promoters are resistant to yes. the idea, but yes. the yes. new yes. generation who are probably yeah. going to succeed, they are more keen yeah. to adopt digital? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, see, the other day I was mm -hmm. listening to Shalil, the CEO of Infosys. One of the greatest things he did in the last five years is to make that Infosys towards the digital area. And now he's succeeding. I see uh, 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 the gentleman running the executive chairman of Wipro, Rishabh Premji, exactly is going that way. TCS has been doing it before. So I see that. I see in Tata's, they build that super app. I see in Adani's, how they're building that. I see in Birla's, how they're doing that. So this is beginning. My joy is the companies in India that are $200 million in sales and they are family owned and somehow they are able to make a good living building forward. They can't wait to get some help, low cost loans, and they're willing and they want to scale up. 
for them, technology is no problem. They know how to get joint ventures and licenses. They have land, the low cost loans, and marketing talent they need. I had one company the other day from Indore, a, about a hundred million dollar company is putting $75 million investment, government uh, helping the whole sector in the, in the garment business and is putting the money in and is going to expand it. It was great to see that how these people are moving to scale up. Just think about 100 million in sales, is putting 75 no. million in a new plant, dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of spirit here. No, you know, sh sure. Uh, no, what I was going to ask you is these are companies which are, are large, many of them are actually established profitable companies who are trying to make a digital transformation to stay competitive. But this is yes. a very large number of companies who are you are probably talking to who are new companies who have no profits today to speak about, who are raising billions of dollars for, of private equity money, but they they will probably come to you to ask what is the route to profitability? What do you tell them? So the profitability, yeah, the key point here is that those who are using AI, first they got to realize that AI is getting commoditized. Second, we have now companies, Indian-based, Travendram, Bangalore, Gurgaon, Pune. These are small companies that are doing digitization at very low cost. And so search those companies they can do that. Hmm. Now, actually, I meant the digital unicorns, the fintechs and edutech yeah. companies mm -hmm. who have mm -hmm. raised lots of money. I mean, they're, the promoters are billionaires, uh, but they are not showing any kind of profits today. Uh, what do you think yeah. of their ability to turn out profits in the next three, four, five years? That's a very good point over there. Uh, just imagine that in the case of digitization, there is a fixed investment to build the data, the algorithms, the tests. And once it is built, then you increase sales. The cost of increased sales by unit is close to zero, and it creates exponential profit. That is the new model of the artificial intelligence-based, machine learning-based business models. So you do they believe that many of these unicorns will actually survive uh, this kind of market downturn that we're seeing today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is in the initial stages. That has nothing to do with their unicorn. It is a normal thing for any startup company. There will be a slip in between the cup and the lip. Their business models may be wrong. They have not done the enough understanding of the customer. Many of them have been funded without any real thinking. Those things are going to happen. Okay. Uh, many, many enough. of the. This is not yeah, the only the, reset which is happening globally. The, what we what we spoke about earlier, uh, the geopolitical reset that we spoke about earlier, Ram. Uh, there is another very fundamental reset which is going on in the financial systems, which is that loose monetary policy is being unwound and interest rates are finally going back to some semblance of normalcy, and that is causing a huge amount of upheaval in the Western world. Uh, how do you see the companies that you speak to dealing with this reset which is going on financially? Yeah, I think the people getting first, uh, if I have not misunderstood, is that we're going to have a recession, that's the viewpoint, not a fact. We're going to have inflation, that's the viewpoint, it will be a fact we could go into hyperinflation. So there is a very simple rule that you do not carry much debt. You must have a dry powder. You're going to manage by the cash, not by EPS. And you're going to trim the unnecessary things you're going to have. And you're going to go through those three, four, five years, and you will see the economy, the structure would have changed to see the new opportunities going forward. We had very good time for several years pre-COVID. And now we funded so much that we're creating inflation to curb inflation we're going to create recession so we're going to go through that cycle and the financial markets are going to react as they have and i think one can argue they're going to react further because the psychology 
of fear and psychology of continued price increases is actually happening right now. So you have no doubt in your mind that this will have to end in a recession, that we will not get off light? I'm very clear we're going to have that. Ram, I want to ask you about your Indian experience. Of course, you were born here, but over the years, you've worked with so many Indian companies and CEOs. Uh, can you share any anecdotes with us on how that experience has been and who are the, who are the large corporations or the CEOs who've actually made an impression on you? Yeah, I think the, the, without naming them, I find the CEOs here, they can manage any business anywhere. They are the best business acumen people you find, separate from strategy. They are very, very conscious of structure. We have people who are best in terms of consumer uh, uh, observations. I had a great experience on the Hindalco board. Uh, Mr. Birla is absolutely outstanding, and he is able to cut through the clutter very fast. It was a great delight to see that. I see Mr. Radhani is very imaginative and very, very respectful of people. And so I have those. I had worked with the board of Mariko. He's a huge fan of the company. Mr. Hart Mariola is a fantastic entrepreneur and, and a great person. I've been him for 30 years. So these are some of the great, but I have also the small companies where these people are unsung roles and they're building, building India going forward. What about globally? I mean, you've worked with big global corporations as well. I mean, if I were to ask you to name just one or two global CEOs who are truly exceptional among the hundreds yes. that you have worked with over the years, who would you, who yeah. would you uh, single yeah. out? So I will tell you about an unsung hero. His name is Ed Woolard. He was the former chairman CEO of DuPont. He joined the board of Apple in 1997. And when he joined the board, he saw the company was going to go broke within a year or so. He saw the board, showed them it will. They asked him to sell the company. Nobody was there to buy it. And he kept saying that the brand refuses to die. Company should not die. He brought Steve Jobs back single-handedly. It's in my book, Boards That Lead. When you look back at such a long career that you've had, uh, do you sometimes feel that you feel tired or burnt out because you basically have carved, carved out a life living in hotels and air, airplanes and airports? I mean, that's what most of your life is. Do you ever have any regrets or feel that you've run too long a race, feel tired about it? I am 83. I wake up at four. I take a one hour walk every single day. Tiredness comes from boredom, not from active mind. Great. That answers my question, Ram. And on that note, I shall thank you for your time. It's been a great pleasure hearing your thoughts. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much for joining in today. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. इस समय पूरी दुनिया में लोग कंफ्यूज्ड हैं वो समझ नहीं पा रहे हैं क्या सही है क्या गलत है क्या सच है क्या झूठ है और ये स्पष्टता हम आपको अपने इस नए शो में देंगे सब कुछ ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट में बताएंगे इस शो में मेरे बालों के अलावा कुछ ग्रे नहीं होगा हर खबर ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट की तरह बिल्कुल स्पष्ट होगी
make your media plan smarter with India Today Live TV on your connected devices. Everyone's busy finding what's trending. You're busy finding out why. India Today for those who research before reacting. Download the India Today app now. You are... Black holes. Did you ever worry that Earth could get stalked into one of them? Black holes do have a massive gravitational pull that allows it to swallow anything that gets in its way. Let's find out more about them. Black holes have been lurking in the galaxies for billions of years. The most powerful known forces in the universe, the gravitational field is so strong that nothing not even light can escape from them. They're actually packed full of space matter, so they're not really holes. There are at least two types of black holes.